morning, everybody. It's great to see you. You can remain seated. Uh, wonderful mm -hmm. to see you here in the room and also to those of you online. Welcome, welcome. It's really great to see you. Um, uh, Sally Gaskell and I are back intact, mm -hmm. survived a, a very, very interesting and wonderful, actually very inspiring trip to Palo Alto, which we will be telling you a little bit about today during the meeting. Um, but what I would like to do is just go directly into the meeting because Sally and I will be talking um, a little bit about, so we're gonna take some time. So I wanna just jump right into the meeting. Um, and uh, my name is Alain Barker, for those of you who are online and for those of you in the room who I have yet to meet, uh, current president of the Bloomington Rotary Club, very happy to be with you again today. Um, <clears throat> So our birthdays, we can just go directly into our birthdays. Um, Walt Kuhn, uh, November 13th, and Trent Deckard, uh, who may or may not be online, uh, November 14th, which is the same day as my daughter. She had her birthday yesterday, and we had a big celebration. Um, <clears throat> so, and then member anniversaries, Ruth Boschkoff. Oh, Ruth, are you here with us today? I don't know if you're online. She's been, oh, Ruth, welcome. There you are, great. Uh, one year, Ruth has been with us for, for a year, and then Jim Cryway has been with us for 34 years, which is totally fantastic. So Jim, congratulations, and it's great to see you all. Um, okay, we, we are going to introduce the guests. Who's introducing the guest today? Winston Schindel. He, I, I got confused about that. The Winston, welcome, and uh, it's good to see you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have three guests today, and uh, as I call your names, would you please stand so that we can recognize you? Uh, Megan Gerhardt, uh, Megan's the past president of Rotor Act and has been very busy. Yeah. Steve Wicks, uh, Steve is a guest of Sally Gaskell. And Katie Norris, who is a guest of Aaron Royington. Welcome and uh, come back again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Winston. And uh, Joy, do we have anybody online who you'd like to introduce? Yes, I certainly do. I am glad to welcome a guest of Michael Shermus, Sherry Treadway, who is actually joining us and she is a member of the Washington Rotary Club. So she's coming to us from Washington, Indiana and also works with Life Designs. And then quickly I'll mention Dick McKay, Everybody wave to Dick because he's in Arizona. Hi, Dick. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. There. Thank you so much. And You're I welcome. should mention that uh, when, when Sally and I were in Palo Alto, they were also leading a hybrid meeting. And it was very interesting to compare notes to see how they were doing it compared to what we're doing. And I think we're doing a pretty good job. So how about that? Um, but, they, but they had some tricks up their sleeve, which I'm going to be sharing with everybody as well. Okay, well, talking about sibling cities and talking about our fantastic weekend, I'm gonna invite Sally to come up here and talk a little bit about um, what we experienced and then I'll come back and talk about where we might be headed with that relationship. And while Sally's talking, um, we, we didn't actually get a, a PowerPoint presentation prepared for today, but there are tons of pictures that I took um, and we'll be just showing them as we, as we speak about our experiences. So I have to tell you that my brain and my heart are full from this amazing trip. Alan and I emerged from an airplane yesterday morning at six o'clock a.m. Yes, we took the red eye. What were we thinking? Um, so we're still getting over that. I, I think I slept maybe 10 or 12 hours last night. Um, but the wonderful thing is that Rotary was at the forefront of the Sibling City Exchange. So you may recall we, we had about five people from Palo Alto here last May, and we did all sorts of things in our community and, and introduced them to uh, people from the city and from uh, nonprofit organizations and other businesses. Um, the Bloomington delegation to Palo Alto this past week included probably at least 15 people, the mayor, the deputy mayor, our director of economic and sustainable development, our director of the arts, and both of those two people are joining our Rotary Club, so they definitely counted as Rotarians there. Jen Pearl, the head of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, Pat East from the Mill, representatives from IU, including Kirk White, and from Ivy Tech. So it was an amazing group of people. And we started off with a 7.30 a.m. meeting of the Palo Alto University Rotary Club uh, last Friday, had a wonderful speaker. 
We then had a discussion on civil discourse led mm -hmm. by Vicki Venker, who's the head of Sibling Cities USA. We toured the Palo Alto Art Center, as well as uh, the Coverly Open Artist Studios. For me as an arts administrator and for Holly Warren from the city, director of the arts, these were fantastic uh, eye-opening experiences. Um, we toured the design school at Stanford University. Uh, and we sat in on some interesting music performances as well. Um, we had on Saturday afternoon, a climate summit, which included local state and federal speakers from the uh, federal department, US Department of Ener Energy. And finally, a performance by the resident string quartet of Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music uh, in a gorgeous church in downtown Palo Alto. It was actually their debut performance. What a rich weekend. Um, and Alain's gonna talk about how some of the discussions that we had with our fellow Rotarians about how we might take this amazing exchange and go on to the next steps. Thank you so much, Sally. And uh, just as a personal reflection of what, what I went through and what I experienced, uh, the climate summit for me was the thing that really uh, made a difference uh, in my mind. Palo Alto as a city has taken climate change oh. and climate amelioration really to heart and, and have, have ended up doing very spectacular. First of all, if you go around the streets of Palo Alto, Teslas are like people's cars. It's just unbelievable. Everybody's dri driving an electric car. Um, but they've also really focused in on clean energy um, and, and activities within the city itself to, to really deal with, with climate change. Um, uh, at the same time, the clubs themselves are really committed to uh, climate action. And it seems to me that many of their international, uh, national and local projects are specifically focused on climate change, um, on, on actions um, uh, against climate change. And so I would say that that's definitely something that we can be focusing on as we think of um, a partnering type of relationship with those clubs as well. There are two clubs in Palo Alto, each of which are about 120 strong. So they have more Rotary members, but they were uh, interested to know that we had no less than three clubs here in Bloomington. So that was something for us to discuss with them. Um, talking about the, the future, um, I've been having some interesting discussions about a project that we're developing here in the spring, um, specifically about youth. Uh, you know that the Rotaract Club um, in Bloomington has been developing. It's been going from strength to strength. It is now about 35 strong. We have um, Interact Clubs that are now blossoming thanks to Joey Harder and her mentorship of those clubs. Um, and we've been talking about, uh, with, the, with, with Lance Eberly, we've been talking about a district-wide conference for Interactors in the spring that we would, and we're still talking about thematic elements associated with it, but we have this belief that youth are our future, of course. Um, and if we can get behind interactives and leadership across the, the district, specifically focusing on things that they can share between themselves, um, it'll make a huge difference to our future as Rotarians, but also to our communities. And I shared this with the group of Rotarians who met with us on our final morning. And they were very excited because there's an intersection with what they're doing in climate and youth leadership. And we thought that perhaps um, as we develop our big project for the spring and we talk about youth action and we're talking about um, youth and peace in particular, but if you think about it, youth and peace very much connects with the idea of the future and the environment. And so we're, we're sort of in, in a conversation with very beginnings of our conversations right now with the, with the Palo Alto clubs about a possibility of youth exchange they were thinking that perhaps they could sponsor three or four um, high school leaders to come to Bloomington when we have our, um, our, our, our program here in Bloomington with, with, with interactors around the, the district. So that's, that's one area that I think would be really interesting for us to focus on. The other thing, uh, Sally and I um, were able to see a few posters, um, poster sessions specifically related to their projects. And we're very interested to see that their international programs are very much about um, the environment as well. And so as, as a club, as we think about where we're going with our international programs, perhaps that's another area that we could be focusing on um, as, a, as a way of partnering with our Palo Alto friends. Um, and altogether, I think that we, we feel very inspired by the fact that the city of Palo Alto and the city of Bloomington are really now 
thinking about strategic directions that they can share between each other. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure that Rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, and other um, social clubs, community clubs, will be able to connect more strongly together as we see the future of that sibling city relationship develop. So that's, that's a sort of a summary, focusing um, really now in the spring on youth and uh, tying hands together with, connect, uh, uh, holding hands together with our Palo Alto friends um, in this project with youth. So that's my, that's my summary there. Um, Kyla, do you want to talk about, about the economic forum, how it went last week, just briefly? Hello, everyone. Uh, we had a wonderful business outlook forum last week on Thursday in partnership with the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce and the Kelly School of Business. I'm really grateful to the Chamber and the Kelly School of Business, uh, who, of course, brought the um, expert panelists uh, who uh, made, I think, the audience um, laugh, along with maybe shed an occasional tear over their outlook. Uh, so thankful to um, the moderator, uh, Phil Powell, and the panelists, um, Kyle Anderson, Andrew Butters, uh, Carol Rogers, and Clark Greiner from the BEDC who joined us. Um, also thankful to anyone who was trying to join us online. Um, I know many of you had to exert some patience if you were joining us online because there were many layers of technical issues that arise often, which of course only increases our gratitude to our wonderful tech team here uh, in our Rotary Club, uh, because when we do this event, we have to uh, come up with a whole different plan and um, our tech team gets the day off typically. So uh, really grateful to our tech team who helps everything go smoothly, as well as the tech team who was on call for the event on Thursday. Um, I think that is the, the quick wrap up. But again, thanks to everyone who made it possible. I know the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce is very um, thankful for our partnership as is the Kelly School of Business. And of course, uh, great thanks to uh, Bard, Baird, the Matthew Snyder group uh, who made it possible for us to be a partner this year. Thanks. Huge thanks to Kyla for leading this project. Really, really fantastic. I, it was it was pretty amazing to see how she was able to take this and, and, and develop it into such a spectacular event, as always, as always. Okay, um, Sarah, do you want to give us a few words quickly about a uh, refugee family update? Isn't this just a spectacular Rotary Club? We have so much stuff going on. It's all cool. Um, on the, on the Mohammedi family front, um, we also have a lot going on. I think we have created a sort of a milestone checklist for ourselves about what we really need to do to make them self-sufficient and independent, fully contributing, working members of this community. And we're moving along on that list. We moved them a couple of weeks ago. I reported that last time. Now we're turning our attention to job searches. Um, they're very distinctly different, the four family members. Those of you who have met them have probably picked that up. So let me just start with Rahim, who carried the couch to their second floor apartment on his back by himself. He, is, he, he has done a little bit of everything in Afghanistan. He describes himself as a mechanic. He's also been an embroiderer. Uh, he works on lawnmowers and sewing machines and any form of equipment like that. He has a seventh grade education because he came up during the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. That was as far as he could go. Um, Jawa here, the mom, is uh, a very accomplished seamstress. She has zero education because she was female under the Russian occupation and then the Taliban occupation. So, but she worked for an international foundation and taught a traditional Afghan um, embroidery techniques to 30 or 40 women at a time in a nine month course. So she's not just a, a putterer, you know, she knows what she's doing. Um, uh, Amina is, has a college degree and is a midwife spent six months in an advanced training, uh, which would probably be nurse practitioner if it were here in this country, uh, in Iran, and uh, worked for a couple of years as a midwife. So she's looking for a job in the healthcare field. Her English is exploding. She's the most capable English speaker of the, of the four. 
She's 24 years old. Um, Shams, Shamsula, is 23. His college hey, uh, hey career was interrupted. He has a high school you? degree. Good. But no college degree. Oh, sure. in, the, in their efforts to escape. Um, but he is artistic and he worked in an optical shop, which in Iran meant that he measured customers for glasses, did all the testing, and then went in the back and made them. So he, he's, he's kind of, you know, he's got good, small hand-eye coordination and customer service skills. His English is improving very quickly as well. If any of you know of any jobs in any of those areas, um, let me know. Or if you would be willing to mentor one of them. As you can imagine, it's like having four adult children all of a sudden who need our help. And so there, we, we need more help. We need more people who will, will come in, not just make suggestions, but will actually help with their resumes and maybe, you know, being, become their friends. Thank you. And, and yes, we are a spectacular club because of people like you, Sarah, and for all of the incredible work that you do to develop this family project, really, really outstanding, as well as everybody else on the team. I know that this is really a team project. Okay, well, uh, this coming Friday, a few of us are going to be going off to Columbus for the, uh, for the, for the foundation gathering, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, if anybody needs a ride, I'm, I'm happy to, to ride out there with you, um, or to take you there, Charlotte. Um, remember that our holiday party is uh, December 8th. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be huge celebrations for the toast, the success of the toast this year. I'm actually having a meeting this afternoon as a roundup meeting for the toast, so this is a very busy, has been a very busy time for our club and definitely time to celebrate on December 8th. Hopefully you're all signing up for that and we'll have a lot of fun. I wanna mention um, something that Jim sent out on email, Jim Bright, uh, the December 19th deadline for the Rotary Global Scholarship, the $40,000 Rotary Global Scholarship. Do you wanna jump up here and say anything about it or just to mention that we've been incredibly successful as a club um, in the past? in nominating as well as uh, uh, supporting those Rotary Scholars who've gone out there, Aubrey Cedar and a bunch of other people. Um, I've got the list here, it's uh, Clarence Cross, we've got Leslie, Le uh, Kelsey Lechner, who's our current member, she's from Columbus as well as any number of others. Um, so if you have ideas of talented youth who could benefit from this phenomenal $40,000 Rotary Scholarship, um, and are ready to go off and do amazing things in Europe or wherever else they choose to study, make sure that Jim Bright is on your radar and that you mention it to him um, and, and motivate them to, to get their, uh, their applications in by December 19th. Yeah, that would be great. Um, let's move to happy dollars. We haven't had happy dollars for a little bit. So um, if anybody wants to mention, I mentioned my daughter turned 22 yesterday it was an absolutely fabulous thing. I do want to say that Raj uh, Hadawi, we have you in our thoughts as well. Um, I know that you've been going through a bit recently, and I can see that you are online, which is absolutely fabulous to see that you're with us today. Um, but we send you our very best wishes and, and, and hopes for a happy recovery, a quick recovery from, I believe that you had a bout of COVID, right? Um, so anyway, anybody else who wants to share? Here we go. Happy dollars. Hopefully, yes, it is. Hopefully every one of you saw last night our fabulous IU women's basketball team beat the Lady Balls, and hopefully every one of you will be coming out again to help support them. Thank you, you guys come running up fast. Um, I had the pleasure of giving the uh, reflection at the Economic Outlook panel, and uh, I just tried to promote uh, our clubs and the service that we do, and how we were inviting and all that. And I had my list and I neglected to mention Teachers Warehouse. Whoa. So yeah, I know, I know, I know. So I just wanna apologize everyone as one of our most important um, services. And also um, yesterday I had lunch with Dr. Patrick Smith. Um, I did mention he earned his PhD recently. So um, this indirectly related to him, but one of the things that I believe is that people don't have to be nice. And when they do choose to be nice, they don't have to be nice to you. So when they're nice to me, I feel blessed. And I have $20 for Teacher's Warehouse. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. 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 
I haven't done this for a long time, but I want to thank the five churches that gathered together to sing the Ore Requiem just in honor of All Saints Day. And also uh, the uh, benefit in honor of uh, our, my sister's closet, which uh, was uh, emceed by our good friend, Connie Chicalis, and I don't see her here, but anyhow, thank you for those wonderful efforts. We've got one from Charlotte here. I, at the risk, I at the risk of being political, I'm just happy I live in the world. I feel it's a little better today. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So I'll ask you, you've got one there. And if anybody online wants to um, open your microphone and speak, now's the time to do so. Here's ten dollars. DePaul beat Wabash last Saturday. Great, thank you. And Martha Foster, go ahead. Oh, you have to unmute your microphone. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm uh, throwing in $10 today for my daughter who ran the marathon in Indy uh, a week and a half ago and uh, got a time that will hopefully qualify her for the Boston Marathon. So I'm a, I'm a proud mama. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm here today to uh, contribute $20 and to say thank you to the Rotary Foundation. This is Rotary Foundation Giving Month. And uh, one of the things that we're happy about is that Rotary Foundation, through the contributions that our club gives and others give in the district, provide the money for the global grants. Excellent. That's really fantastic. And that's a great segue. And I'm going to uh, use my executive privilege here to just move directly into a reflection with Yolanda Trevino, if you'd like to come up, because that is something that being half tired and what have you, I jumped over completely in our meeting today. So it's a great segue into um, Yolanda. So fun fact, <clears throat> did you know that of the first four Rotarians, one was a Hoosier? And that person was a part of the energy uh, industry back in 1905. His name was Sylvester Shiley, and he was a coal dealer from Terre Haute. He served as the club's, Rotary Club's very first president. And he was also the RI treasurer, Rotary International Treasurer in 1945. So some magnificent projects grow from very small seeds. The Rotary Foundation, which this is the Rotary Foundation month, has that sort of modest beginning. In 1917, RI President Arch Klumpf told the delegates of the, uh, to the Atlanta Convention that it seems eminently proper that we should accept endowments for the purpose of doing good in the world. The response was polite and favorable, but the fund was slow to materialize. A year later, the Rotary Endowment Fund, as it was first labeled, received its first contribution of $26.50 from the Rotary Club of Kansas City, which was the balance of the Kansas City Convention account following the 1918 annual meeting. Additional small amounts were annually contributed, but after six years, it was reported that the endowment fund had only reached $700. It's staggering to imagine that from those humble beginnings, the Rotary Foundation is now receiving more than $85 million each year for educational and humanitarian work around the world. Solving real problems takes real commitment and vision. Rotary's people of action have used their passion, energy, and intelligence to take action on sustainable projects. From literacy and peace to water and health, Rotarians are always looking and working to better our world, and we stay committed to the end. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you. It was wonderful. Okay, so we have our program today. We're going to go right into our program. So, Leslie, I know that our, our guest, Peter DeVise, is going to be online, but you're going to introduce her from, from the lectern here. Yeah, great. Hello, and thank you, Alon. 
Uh, Betty DeWeese has been working to support people with disabilities for more than 30 years. She started at Stone Belt as a direct support professional and advanced within the organization to become the chief operations officer, a position where she oversaw all the programs for Stone Belt's 1,300 clients and the 500 staff that serve them. In April of this year, the board of directors selected Bitta to become its fourth CEO, a very wise decision, in my opinion. One of Bitta's areas of expertise is supported employment. She truly believes that everyone can work and it's our job to find the right supports and the right em employer to make that happen. She, all, all, she not only practices this at Stone Belt, but she advocates for this throughout the state. She has been involved with multiple school systems and has worked with many school staff to help them understand funding and Medicaid waivers and for services after high school. Bitta is frequently called upon to be a member of committees and task forces with the state administration, helping to shape state policies that promote employment, community living, and increased opportunities for people with disabilities to live full and direct, self-directed lives. Bitta has a bachelor's degree in psychology from Indiana University, she and her husband, Scott, co-own Safe and Sound Security here in Bloomington. It is my pleasure to invite Beta, our fellow Rotarian, to share information and, and insight about Stone Belt and the people it serves. So, Beta. Thank you, Leslie. I still wish I were there with all of you in person, but if there's anything I've learned in the last two and a half years, it's sometimes things change quickly and you got to pivot. So here we are pivoting and figuring it out. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about what surviving a pandemic has been like for Stone Belt and how we're moving into the future. That looks like they're getting my slides set up. Thank you very much. And we can go ahead and go right to the second one. I'm going to start with a real brief overview today of Stone Belt. But then what I really want to talk about is how we're surviving and where we are today. I plan to tell most of this story through pictures because I think that's a better representation of what things have been like for us. I want to give so much credit to Leslie Green, who was the CEO during the majority of the pandemic the first two years and who gathered many of the photos I'm going to show you today. So I'm going to talk about Stone Belt here at a glance to give you some overview before we get into the the photos. For those of you who don't know, Stone Belt was started in 1959 by local families. Provide, we provide a variety of supports to adults and children with developmental disabilities. Annually, we do serve over 1,300 individuals a year, but pre-pandemic, we were serving closer to 2,500. Stone Belt operates 15 facilities in three different counties in South Central Indiana. We have an annual budget of over 21 million, and I think we're quite a bit larger of an employer than most people realize with between 450 and 500 staff. Next slide. The core services that we offer at Stone Belt include residential services. We have two types of residential services. We have 11 group homes, three are in Bedford and eight here in Bloomington. And those are homes that Stone, Stone Belt owns and we serve 60 different clients in those homes. We have 49 supported living sites, which are apartments or homes that people rent and share with roommates. And we're serving over 100 individuals with varying levels of support in that residential program. In community employment, we help about, up oh, we'll stay there for a few more minutes, about 50 individuals a year find jobs out in the community. We run internship programs in partnership with Cook and other employers for young adults with disabilities. And we have pre-employment programs within all the school systems around here, supporting students to learn about employment. We have large manufacturing contracts where we do work for Cook primarily in our, in our facilities and ship that work back to Cook. We have employment fundamental programs where we do pre-employment training to help adults learn the skills they need for employment. And then finally, we have our milestones clinic, which covers clinical, therapy, behavioral support, nursing, and skills development services. Next slide. So here's a picture of Stone Belt in 2020, you might, or 20, February, excuse me, of 2020. You might recognize Leslie up there. She's um, at the State House with a group of self-advocates and Senator Eric Cook 
it's a tradition for people with disabilities to go to the state house on Valentine's Day and deliver Valentine's to the legislators and really make sure they're aware of the issues that people with disabilities face. And this is one of the highlights every legislator will tell you of their year is Valentine's Day. Next slide. Here we are also in February of 2020 when we had our last IMU performance. IMU is a stage performance where a group of our clients decide they wanna tell their story to the world. And so they present performances that represent who they are and whatever that might mean to them. Some people share poems, some people share their, their stories, some people share acting, but it's all about showing how we are all alike and not so different and how I am just like you. Next slide. There we are mingling. Look at that, shoulder to shoulder, no masks in sight. Everybody's having a great time. We had no idea what was coming next month. Next slide. And then March 13th of 2020 hit. Stonebelt was hit pretty early in the pandemic um, because we had a staff that was exhibiting symptoms of COVID on March 13th before the system had shut down. And so we quickly realized what was coming and went into an initial panic. We didn't know what we were doing, but we shut down our services very quickly on March 13th. We closed all of our facilities. We based our services and redeployed all of our staff to our residential clients' homes or to working remotely or to working in our manufacturing arena. We were really scrambling to find PPE and protective equipment. The only thing we could find to order that we could get our hands on initially was bandanas. We were sending videos to our staff telling them how to roll their bandanas so it was double or triple masks and how they could use rubber bands for the earpieces while we were scrambling to find equipment to keep people safe. We really felt like we were figuring things out on our own because uh, there was really no guidance to tell us how to keep our clients and our staff safe. We were on the CDC website, the Indiana State Department of Health website and the Monroe County Health website daily reaching out to people for information. We were struggling to figure out what the worst case scenarios might be and how we might handle them. We were looking for different locations where we might house individuals if they were to come down with COVID. We set up hundreds of new policies and procedures. We were constantly training, communicating to staff and clients and families, setting up remote meetings and figuring out how to get started. Next slide. But pretty quickly, we moved out of panic and moved into resilience because we had to. We learned how to stock up on supplies and bought everything we could get our hands on. We were finally able to start getting adequate PPE and surgical masks and things. We obviously learned that hand handkerchiefs were not protecting us very much. So we got our hands on better equipment. We even set up our own vaccination clinic when our clients were unable to get vaccinated. They were not treated as a category at risk and were only allowed to be vaccinated when they reached the age category. So we worked with the state of Indiana to set up a vaccine clinic in our gym and got 200 clients with disabilities vaccinated against, the, um, against COVID. And we did that in partnership with Life Design, so vaccinated many of their clients as well. And we had an amazing CFO who was applying for grants and loans like crazy that kept us afloat. Next slide. We were sending out pictures of how to put that gown on and how to wear that mask and doing YouTube videos and town hall meetings to make sure people understood what would protect them and what would protect clients. And that was all during the summer of 2020. Next slide. And then we very quickly learned to move into new ways of delivering services. People were isolated, people were in their homes, they couldn't leave, they didn't understand what was going on. Our staff didn't understand how to support people through that. So we quickly were able to figure out how to bring activities into the home via Zoom. And so I don't know if you can see that on the bingo game, but you can see that it's telling you who got bingos. Um, Alicia got a bingo and Joe got a bingo. 
and everybody's playing bingo over Zoom from 20 different locations. And then we would have staff go out and deliver prizes to the winners and leave them on the doorstep. We had a staff who every week did a cooking class from our home. She would put the word out early on of what supplies and, and food items people needed to be able to participate. And they would cook together on Saturday mornings. Next slide. We had clients who had community jobs when the pandemic hit and 16 clients continued working throughout the entire pandemic because they were essential workers. There's Marcus working at Kroger getting ready to go. We also supported so many students in school through our pre-employment program um, and actually helped them graduate. So many students were thrown into chaos during that time and, and the mental health conditions that people were dealing with really made it difficult for them to participate and learn and complete their assignments on Zoom. And so we have several success stories where because of the work of our staff, and the virtual support they received, they got their diploma that year. And that probably wouldn't have happened without that. You see one of my most heartfelt pictures right there. Clients couldn't see their families. We were not allowed to let people be together for a period of months. And so we had drive-by visits and window visits. And there's Aaron visiting with his mom through the window at his group home. Next slide. We had drive-by birthdays. There's Michael having his birthday celebration. What you can't see is all the cars driving by and honking and celebrating and the presents left at the end of the driveway. We learned to do therapy by Zoom. Clinical services were of great demand and in great need because there was really extreme anxiety on a lot of people's part at the beginning. It was a very, very scary time, but through technology, and we'd never even heard of Zoom, as so many of you probably hadn't prior to March of 2020. But through, through these technological connections, we were able to provide some level of continued support while we supported our clients in their home. There are so many stories. I could do a whole presentation to you on the stories of the heroes that work at Stonebelt, especially during this early time. The first time a client got COVID, and our staff didn't shy away, but raised their hand and said, I'll go, I'll go work in that home. I can take care of them, even though that's gonna put me or my family at risk because I know that they need me. Our staff were taking sick clients to appointments. They were making visits happen however they could to do it safely. They were trying to keep clients active when they couldn't leave their home. And they were providing incredible emotional support because so many of our clients like so many of the rest of us, truly didn't fully understand what was going on. We just knew that life had completely changed from what we had been used to. The workers at Stonebelt are absolute true heroes. Next slide. So then we got through that summer and started to come back slowly. We realized we couldn't stay in that place and we'd learned a lot about what we thought was safe and what wasn't safe. So we slowly began to open our services back up for those who were able to socially distance and to wear a mask. So you can see us taping off floors at six feet. We set up lots of separate tables. Every station had hand sanitizer. There's Isaac cleaning off the table between activities in Columbus. Next slide. We went back to work the most quickly in our manufacturing area. As a matter of fact, during the entire pandemic, we never missed a shipment of product to cook. And for a couple months, our staff had to do those products, but in our manufacturing was the very first area that we brought clients back to work because they could socially distance and wear a mask. And we kept shipments going to cook at a time where they critically needed them uh, because they were having a lot of supply issues with other suppliers. And then you can see the art projects we were doing. Here's some of the more fun stuff. The Buddy Walk that year, normally that's a huge event where people to come together, but it was a virtual event that year. So we did our best to make it a team effort and had different teams from each home and they would send in their results. Things like that started to bring some hope that there would be times we could get back together. But truly the biggest joy was that fall um, and all the credit for this goes to Leslie 
and Adam Hamill and their incredible vision of saying, we have to figure out a way to get together safely and their tenacity to make it happen. So who knew you could rent out the drive-in? Well, we figured it out and we held our annual awards at the drive-in theater in September of 2020. Cars drove up into the theater and picked up boxed dinners that they had ordered in advance. People brought some lawn chairs, but they stayed in their one driving space. We had spaces in between each car. And we watched on the big screen while we announced the award winners for all of our staff and clients that year. And we honked horns instead of clapping. So that's a whole lot of fun and a whole lot of noise. And it all ended with fireworks. And uh, Leslie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that first year we did it at the drive-in, there was a bit of a drought. And so we weren't sure until at the last minute whether the fire marshal was, was going to approve those fireworks or not. But the evening ended in explosions and it was so wonderful. So where we are today is serving approximately 1300 clients in the past year. We're still trying to bring clients back to employment, our day programs. We're at about 75% capacity. We're still trying to get back to full in-person in our clinical um, services and, and doing less virtual. Our absolute biggest struggle is staffing now more than the pandemic. We are certainly learning to live with how we respond to COVID as I'm living proof of being with you here on Zoom today. We're learning to handle how to move forward and we can contact trace better than any healthcare agency out there. And we still do that so that we can do our best to keep people safe. We're absolutely figuring out what our new normal looks like. And we make adjustments every single day into how we're gonna provide services or how we're gonna deal with the, the latest threat or the newest challenge today. We're spending all kinds of time teaching, training, supporting, and trying to get back to having fun. We have so many staff in our organization right now that don't even know what Stonebutt looked like prior to the pandemic because we've hired so many new people. So continually supporting people to get back into the community, get back to our mission and provide the quality supports that clients want. Next slide. So I'm, um, I'm showing you a couple of our more joyous, most recent moments. And at the end of October, we had a Halloween party. And here's several of our clients dressed up. They're at 10th Street, um, getting ready for the we'll Go ahead, next slide. Where they made creepy, cruddy, crawly food and just had a wonderful time. It was one of our first in-person client parties um, that we'd had in quite some time. Next slide. I want to tell you a story here at the end of what this wreath represents for us at Stonebelt. This wreath symbolizes where we're never going back to. We're never going back to being unprepared. This wreath, do you remember the bandanas I showed you at the beginning? And that was the only thing we could get our hands on to protect our staff. About six months ago, one of our administrative assistants took all the bandanas we didn't use and shredded them and turned them into this beautiful wreath. And it symbolizes how we're never going back to being unprepared. We have learned so much about resilience and follow through and how to keep people safe and keep things moving. And we will always recognize this wreath as a way of saying, we don't have to go back there. We'll never be unprepared again. We are, we are struggling. We are very much struggling to come back to the quality of services that we want to have. And I've been known to say a lot in the last two months that we thought the pandemic was gonna be the hardest time in Stonebelt's history. I'm not sure trying to come out of it isn't even harder, but we are resilient and we have learned so much and we are surviving and we will soon be thriving again. So thank you for your time and I'm open for any questions people may have. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see if there are any questions in the room. If anybody would like to raise your hand, if you have a question, or anybody on Zoom, since you 
are on Zoom. You can just open your microphone and speak to Bitta. We have a question here in the room. Yes, thank you very much for this enlightening presentation. In our club, we have a lot of different concerns like racial justice and environmental um, concerns. I wonder how do you think our country and our region is doing in dealing with uh, persons with disabilities? We've had a lot of improvements over the years, but I just wonder where do you see it right now? Are, do we have a lot of things we still have to do or are we doing a pretty good job? And that's a great question, thank you. I think in general, the state of Indiana is doing a very good job and that job has been improving significantly in the last couple of years. I think great strides are being made to fully recognize that people with disabilities have the right to be included in their communities and particularly some significant movement in terms of employment for people with disabilities in their community. And Indiana is really putting resources behind making sure that people can get jobs and have self-sustaining lives and live their best life and really helping people understand that that is somebody's choice to decide what their best life is. But we have an obligation to help people understand what those choices might be and what that might look like. I also want to give an incredible shout out to Bloomington because Bloomington is an incredibly welcoming community. And in my 32 years experience um, in the field has always been one of the most welcoming places to do services for people with disabilities and is always very accepting and supportive and progressive in terms of um, how they sort of wrap their arms around people that belong in their community and it, that includes people with disabilities. Thank you. Uh, Jim, Jim Bryant, do you have a question? Uh, Betta, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for that presentation. You really uh, touched our hearts. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I can't imagine how difficult, you know, that COVID period was for you and your team and, and your clients. And you showed amazing creativity and amazing resilience. And I, for one, am so proud to have you as a fellow Rotarian. Um, but I guess my question would be, I know that you're woefully understaffed. What's it gonna take to attract uh, you know, the people that you need to fill those slots? Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for your kind words. It, it was a very difficult time, but we're survivors. I have been in the employment arena for my whole career, as Leslie talked about, and I've never seen anything like the staffing crisis that we're in today. The biggest challenge is that it's not just a stone belt crisis. Every business is struggling and there are not enough workers to fill the number of jobs that exist out there. We've seen this coming. We knew this was coming, but we didn't expect it for several more years and the pandemic exacerbated that. So that makes it even more challenging for Stonebelt because we can't raise the price of our product so that we can pay our staff more. We're at the mercy of 85% of our funds are Medicaid funds and we don't control what those rates are set at. And so every single day we're talking about what it's gonna take. I think some of the future for Stonebelt is to figure out how to provide services differently and to potentially downsize some of our residential services. That doesn't mean we're not gonna to try to continue to serve all the clients we have, but how to do that in ways where maybe we combine more homes so that we need less staff. We're also looking at things like electronic monitoring where people can be more independent in their home and not have to have a staff at all times. And then we're focusing on growing the services that teach more independence, like helping somebody get a job. So once they've gotten that job, that staff can move on and support another client. So for us, we don't think we can fix the staffing crisis because we're never gonna be able to pay enough to make our staffing flush. So we're looking at new ways of providing staffing and doing business. Right, okay, we have one more question here in the room, unless there's anybody online. Here we go. Hi, um, I'm wondering what are the main positions that you're looking to fill and what are the qualifications that people need to meet to um, apply for those jobs? 
The main positions we're looking to fill are direct support professionals. And the qualifications are high school diploma or GED and B18. When we need people the most are on weekends, but we run 24 seven, 365. So the things we like to tout and, and a big part of our strategy in terms of um, recruiting staff right now is what makes Stonebelt an incredible place to work. We have shifts anytime you want, nights, evenings, days, weekends, weekdays. We have great sign-on bonuses. We have great benefits. But we really want to tell that it's a real place where you can make a difference in someone's life. When I first started at Stonebelt, I was technically not called a DSP, but it would have been the equivalent, a direct support professional. And I used to say, I can't believe I get paid to go out in the community with people with disabilities and like hang out at the Y and exercise and then go to the hot tub and then maybe stop and have lunch on the way home before we go home. What a great job that is. You know, you can't get that at McDonald's or working on an assembly line. So what makes Stonebelt a great place to work is all of the joy that we have every day and all the great things you can do to support somebody with a disability to change their life. Amazing, really, really fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you, I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. I wish I was. Well, better, uh, hopefully you'll recover very quickly and you'll feel better and, and, and able to come and join us here again in, in, in person. And once again, thank you for being such an inspiring person to us all, as well as leading such an extraordinary organization. Really, really, really amazing. Thank you. Okay, well, next week we will meet here and we, there's a club assembly and I have a bunch of ideas that I will be sharing with you um, on email during the week. Um, I'd love for this to be as participatory as possible next week. Um, basically, what I'm going to be asking is for a snapshot of where we are as an organization halfway through the year. Uh, reminding ourselves about some of the programs that we're doing, but also getting as much feedback from you about where we might be going for the year. Um, and also mindful of the fact that we're still coming out of COVID um, and ideas that you might have about where we might want to go um, beyond, beyond COVID, beyond the COVID era. So with that, um, thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, find the, the, there we go, the mallet. And let's stand up and recite the four way plus one test. Of the things we think, say, or do, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? Thank you. Thank you so much. See you next week.